Hello everyone! Before we start the lectures of Konstantin Petrov, first of all, we would like to tell you about him. Petrov Konstantin Pavlovich was a general major of the Russian military. He was also a social and military activist, a candidate of technical sciences, a member of the International Academy of Informatization, and the chairman of the conceptual political party, Unity. Having come across the conception of social safety, CSS, he studied it, and since 1991, he was politically active in spreading his views concerning the conception of social safety among all social spheres of the Commonwealth of Independent States, as well as in the political circles of Russia. Moreover, he allegedly introduced Putin to the conception when he became president. General Major Petrov also stated that Putin mastered the material set out in the conception of social safety, on the basis of which he has been carrying out his activity so far. Petrov gave a speech during parliamentary hearings in the Duma, held on the 28th of November, 1995. By unanimous vote, it was decided that the CSS is the only legitimate ideology in Russia, not only formally, but also juridically. Based on the conclusions made during these parliamentary hearings, a new book named The New Strategical Initiative was published. This book was provided to rulers at all levels. However, following the conception means changing oneself, as well as qualitatively changing the society for the better. For this reason, rulers at all levels preferred to continue life in the old way. Those who wanted changes were blown away by the political wind. This is why everything concerning the conception of social safety is silenced in the Commonwealth of Independent States. For example, the book Murta Vada, Dead Water, part of the conception, was included in the list of extremist literature and forbidden for publishing in spite of the fact Putin himself had formally approved the CSS few days previously. All these clan cooperative internal political affairs remain invisible and therefore are not properly reflected in mass media. Konstantin Petrov's fame is largely attributed to the video lectures on the conception of social safety, which he recorded in 2004 and actively distributed on compact discs. In the Commonwealth of Independent States, these lectures became popular among patriots, pseudo-patriots, as well as those who genuinely cared about the future of their countries and the planet. Not all the things announced in his lectures will find a response among representatives of other cultures. However, in our point of view, they are quite informative and can contribute to one's better understanding of current events and development perspectives of any particular country, as well as the world. Also to the political line of the Kremlin and Putin personally, in the international and global arenas. These lectures are voiced over from the first person. We, the administrators of Russian View, have decided to create a channel and translate the mentioned lectures of Petrov as well as other lectures on the CSS, because it is time for global awakening, planetary hearings. The conception of social safety should become heritage to all nations of planet Earth. What are the cause and effect relationships of the global crisis? In this video, we are going to discuss the process of globalization on global and regional scales. Today, here in Tumen, we are beginning a series of lectures on the conception of social safety. Why the conception of social safety, but not national safety? Many people take the conception of social safety to mean order in the streets, civil behavior in public, or something else. The name conception of national safety is not correct from our point of view. Why? Because it is too specific. Russia, and moreover, the population of our planet, consists of many nationalities. So, in our opinion, it is more correct to raise a question on the conception of social safety, so that all the people on Earth live peacefully and happily. To begin with, let's look into the following issue. To put it mildly, things are not going well in our country. This is clear for all to see. It is recognized on the state level, 
also by scientists, politicians and sociologists. Why in this country rich in gas, natural oil, gold, timber, coal, nickel, everything compared to other countries? Why are the people here so poor? Why are there so many problems while in countries poor in natural resources, in particular in Europe, people live well? Why? What's going on in our country? And the most essential question, what do we have to do to get out of this situation? Let's find answers to all these questions. All of you have probably heard the term anti-globalists. The media tells us that there are many of them in European countries and in the US. You can see them in different capitals protesting. Recently, there was a Sea Island Summit where the leaders of the leading eight countries of the world met. There was an attempt from anti-globalists to hinder this summit, but they were not allowed in. This was broadcast on television. A natural question arises. If there are anti-globalists, are there globalists? Who are they? What do they do? What is globalization? Many scientists associate globalization with a precise issue, either economic globalization or military expansion. In fact, generally speaking, globalization is a process of concentrating governance of the productive forces of humanity. Let's look at it simply. There was a time in Earth's history when the native people of America did not know that Columbus living over the ocean would discover them one day. People living on the Iberian Peninsula did not know that there were Russians. Russians did not know that just across the sea there were Japanese people. The Japanese did not know that across the Pacific Ocean there were Native Americans. This was a time in history when people could live the way they wanted to. Soon countries and nations began interacting with each other in a different way. How did this develop? Kings of neighboring nations initiated marriage between their children and united their kingdoms. Or one state conquered another one through warfare using weaponry. If the wheat growing in my country was better than yours, I could also subjugate the interests of your country to mine. Having implemented a religion into your country, I can also subjugate the interests of your country to mine. This was what was going on. If we look at the history of humanity, then we will see that the entire history is a process of concentrating governance of the productive forces of humanity. Now, whether we like it or not, whether everyone understands it or not, we live in a time when this process is actually complete. This process was ongoing on a regional level. An example is our country, Russia. Cossacks and Slavic-speaking people, such as Yermak Timofeyevich, Dezhnev and Khabarov, joined the Siberian lands. What was that? That was the process of concentrating governance of the productive forces. The same process was occurring on a global level. The first ones who consciously came to an understanding of this issue were the ancient Egyptian Zhratsis. Zhratsis are a caste of people in ancient states who ruled their societies on the basis of monopolistic possession of knowledge. Why the ancient Egyptian Zhratsis, but not the ancient Russian Zhratsis? Because the social environment was different in both places. Egypt was a strip country 3,500 years ago. What is a strip country? Imagine the Nile River. On the left and right sides of the river, there is a narrow strip of fertile land. Further on, there is only a desert. Many people live on this narrow strip of fertile land. All these people want to be happy, but there isn't enough happiness for everyone. Therefore, Egypt waged wars for living space and often lost in these wars. Who ruled Egypt? They say pharaohs did. Pharaohs were just silly boys. The real rulers of ancient Egypt were the Zhratsis, wielding secret knowledge which belonged only to them and which they hid from the masses, enabled them to manipulate the consciousness of all people, from illiterate mobs to pharaohs themselves, 
which is properly shown by Boleslav Pras in his novel Pharaoh. By the way, it is also a film. The film shows how Zhratsis manipulated the Pharaoh and killed him in the end by possessing secret knowledge of the solar eclipse. So the ancient Egyptian Zhratsis worked out a way to wage wars using cultural exchange, or what is called information wars. In order to realize their goals, they created a specific troupe. I say again, the entire history on the global level is a process of concentrating governance of productive forces of humanity. And this process is already complete. In Russia, about 3,500 years ago, there were no such social tensions. Imagine, you and I live in the same village. We cannot get on with each other. As a result, we quarrel. So I decide to move to a neighboring forest and live there. There is wood for me to build a house, game to hunt, and fresh water to drink. I may thrive. As for Egypt, there was no place to go but to the desert. Thus, social tensions pushed out the ancient Egyptian dresses to work out methods of waging wars by means of cultural exchange. Nowadays, what many politicians call the world government, the forces of the West, in our country, in Russia, or the man behind the curtain, is that very mafia, who has always been ruling the processes on planet Earth. They have migrated and now their headquarters is Switzerland. By the way, here is something to think about. In the Russian movie 17 Moments of Spring, there is an episode when Europe is burning the fires of war, while Dr. Pleschner is feeding swans in Lake Geneva. A question arises about Adolf Hitler. If the Führer was such a brilliant guy, why did he not rob Swiss banks? There was so much money and gold there. Hitler steered clear because Switzerland was untouchable. Why? Because Hitler definitely realized that his masters were there. Hitler's victory march in Europe symbolized a surrender of all European manufacturing and military potential under his unified governance in order to attack the USSR. The thing with carrying out this globalization is that these globalists, this very mafia, have led humanity to a global system crisis. The existence of this crisis is recognized by all scientists. Actually, you yourselves know that we have crises in the spheres of ecology, economy, financial credit system, military, and so on. There are problems everywhere. What's more, I can confirm that the causes of this crisis were revealed at the conference in Johannesburg. What was the nature of that conference? In August 2002, leaders of all states on the planet Earth, or their deputies, gathered at the second conference. They discussed how all nations and countries could live in harmony on planet Earth. This first conference took place in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, where our country was represented by Rutskoy. In Johannesburg, our country was represented by Kasyanov. At both conferences, the state leaders considered ways we could all live with each other. During the first assembly, they put forward the goals on environmental protection. You might have heard about the Kyoto Protocol, an international environmental agreement. Having assembled for the second time 10 years later in Johannesburg, they admitted that the situation had worsened rather than improved. In this video, we began opening up the cause and effect relationships of globalization. What I'm going to say now can be checked in the political magazine Expert, edition 37, issued on September 2, 2002. The statistics I'm going to specify now can also be looked up in this magazine. Describing the situation in Johannesburg, it states that the so-called prosperous countries of Europe and the USA make up 15% of the world's population. This 15% consume 75% of all the resources extracted by people on the planet. The remaining 85% receive 25% of all extracted resources. 
These are the non-prosperous countries. The most important thing is how this magazine also speaks of the third power. They admit the existence of this third power, which in fact issued an ultimatum to everyone at this conference in Johannesburg. If prosperous countries set targets on the protection of the ecology, clean air, clean water, and so on, leaders of the poor countries, including Russia, set targets on more simple and everyday things. The protection of the ecology was out of the question for them. In other words, some kind of conflict arose. So how did this third power manifest? Heads of transnational banks and corporations issued an ultimatum having said, we can solve problems of the poor and the rich if you transfer to us undivided possession of all infrastructures enabling vital functions. This applies in particular to the sector of energy, water and raw material, natural resource extractions. Here is the physical evidence of what many politicians have alluded to. The global mafia is made up of various heads of transnational banks and corporations. There are 358 clan financial families who possess 50% of all assets accumulated by the entirety of humanity. Such information is also available. The most famous surnames are Rothschild, Morgan, Oppenheimer and so on. They are the owners of these banks, including the ones in Switzerland. Now imagine, on the one hand we have 6 billion people, but on the other one we have 6,000 people, including their relatives and other family members. However, the scales in terms of material well-being are balanced. It is the same old song in terms of human values, humanist ideals and other verbal fornication by means of which we get fooled. In fact, we have always lived in a civilization of global slavery. But these globalists faced various problems a long time ago. By the way, these problems served as grounds for the First World War and, in particular, speaking of Hitler's appearance, for the Second World War. Nowadays, it is admitted that there are three global problems. The first problem, and I emphasize it, is that they think that there are too many people, six billion. They think that the Earth can handle two or maximum three billion people. It is the theory of the golden billion. In other words, there is this golden billion of people chosen by God as they think. They live in abundance. The second billion are the ones who serve these people chosen by God. It is acceptable to have an auxiliary billion like us, manure worms, loosening the ground for future plantations. The remaining three billion people are excess population. Excess population, how do you like that? According to the agenda of the globalists, these excessive people should die themselves. The second problem is raw material. The earth is round, not square. There is nothing around the corner. All the lands have been reconnoitered. Therefore, they have decided to take all the reconnoitered resources under their control. At the very beginning we said that Russia is rich in everything. Let's look at prosperous Europe. Nowadays, many young Russian people are envious of Europe, especially France and Germany, their way of life. However, in prosperous Europe, there is neither oil, nor silver, nor aluminum, nor nickel. In fact, there isn't even timber there, there are only parks. In spite of all that, they live much better there than we do in Russia, although we have gas, oil, aluminum and so on. Why do we live poorly? We get plundered like schmucks. However, the majority of people don't even try to understand how it is all done. How come in the naturally rich country we live poorly, but in the naturally poor countries of Europe they live richly? So we have a raw material crisis. Many scientists say that in 15 to 20 years people will wage wars for water. In particular, Lushkov, 
the mayor of Moscow from 1992 to 2010, spoke of diverting the Siberian River southwards in order to sell water. This is how we have reached the third problem – ecological issues. Everybody knows that there is an ecological crisis. There is a deficiency of pure water. I remember drinking tap water when I was a boy. I suppose hardly anybody drinks tap water nowadays. In order to understand how this problem is being solved, imagine, we are that very mafia. We live in Switzerland. In Chernobyl there is a disaster. As a result, radioactive clouds cause radioactive rains to fall in our location. So the ecological situation is really acute. We therefore decide to remake the national economy of the planet, so that we can have ecological clean regions for our own living, and turn polluted regions with chemical production and processing of metals into raw material sources. Through the prism of these three problems, we should look at what is happening to our country. Through the prism of the ecological problem, we should look at the situation in Crimea. I was often there throughout the time of perestroika. What was planned there? Crimea is a unique ecological region of the planet where Russians, Ukrainians and Tatars are turned against each other. The Black Sea Fleet was successfully rusting. If you follow news in the papers, you should know that the situation is escalating there. They want to push people into massacring each other. They want to make another version of Kosovo there. Then peacekeeping troops will be sent. Blocking the Crimean Isthmus, they plan to clear out the ecological clean region for their own living. They are doing the same thing in the Altai Mountains. They build fashionable roads there. It is forbidden to create and develop manufacturing. There are deer sanctuaries there. They are preparing the whole region for themselves alone. They are doing the same thing around Lake Baikal. I have been there and seen for myself. Here is a prime example of the problems and how such problems are being solved. As I said before, through the prism of these three problems we should look at what is happening to our country. There is another important problem that we need to take into account when weighing the current situation. It is the crisis of the world's financial credit system. Many people suspect that this problem exists, but they think of it as something distant, that it will never touch upon them. However, whether they like it or not, it will touch upon them, upon every one of us. In fact, we all live in a kingdom of crooked mirrors, a distorted world. We should turn most things in the world right side up. One of these imposed distortions is money makes money. It is not money that we eat. We eat porridge made out of grain grown by farmers. We eat this porridge with a spoon made by a factory worker. We sit at a table made by a carpenter. What is money for? Money escorts the circulation of goods and services via its currency. In other words, some make vests, some make computers, and so on. Every one of them won't roam around the world selling their goods. We introduce it into trade. Imagine, there is a circulation of goods and services, and there is a circulation of money. There should be equality between the mass of goods and the mass of money. If there is more money than goods, it is called inflation. If there is less money than goods, it is deflation. Nowadays, the average annual statistical growth of goods and services in prosperous countries is no more than around 1%, maximum 3%. This is defined by the growth of a country's energy capacity, electric plants. This is because all goods are produced on the basis of electricity. Imagine again, we are that mafia. You are Rothschild, he is Oppenheimer or Morgan, and so on. We make our fortune at the expense of usury. We lend money at an interest rate. To put it mildly, we do no good. In fact, we live at others' expense, as we do not produce anything.
In addition, we are the source of inflation. For instance, I lend you 1,000, but you have to pay me back 1,200. I lend the state 1 billion, but the state has to pay back 1.2 billion, depending on the interest rate. This situation on a global scale leads to a rise in inflation. Which monetary unit is the world currency? Everybody knows that it is the dollar. I want to inform you that the dollar mass transcends the global trade from an estimated range of between 30 and 50 times. This situation laid the groundwork for our perestroika. So we are that mafia. We realize there are too many dollars. We therefore have to do something. What do we have to do? We decide to postpone the collapse of the dollar, having tied all the manufacturing and raw material potential up in the back by nothing waste paper dollar, at the hands of the brainless Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev. Within this time, we create a new monetary unit, the euro. However, we cannot print out euros overnight. As a result of perestroika, we pack all the potential of the USSR, including its reserves, to the back by nothing dollar. Here is another example. We Russians were used as a garbage bag for this back by nothing dollar. We were used to contain the collapse of the dollar. Within that time, the Mafia created the new monetary unit. First, they introduced it into the non-cash payment system. In 2002, they introduced it into the cash payment system. Here comes a question. Do they need the dollar? No, they don't. Who prints dollars? The USA does. What does this mean? This means that the USA is on the way out. What is happening to the US now, particularly in Iraq, is a result of this phenomenon. Let's begin with the attack on the Twin Towers in New York on September the 11th, 2001. This attack was not organized by Osama bin Laden. This poor Bedouin sits in his cave, and the only thing he can do is make Shahid belts and stuff them with screws. The attack on the Twin Towers was a powerful operation prepared by the special forces of the global mafia in order to bring the US into a war against the Islamic world. What for? How did they collapse the USSR? We will go into detail later. However, I want to say something now so that you can understand. What were they doing? They were propagandizing, saying, the USSR is a prison house of nations. The USSR is an evil empire. Now they paint the US with the same brush. When Clinton was bombing Belgrade, the entire Slavic world said, why are you sticking your nose in our business? Imagine, you live near Belgrade, for instance, in Austria or Italy. The people living over the ocean are bombing the capital of a European state. This definitely wasn't shown on TV. However, people knew it. At that time, the entire Slavic world asked, America, why are you sticking your nose in here? When the U.S. entered Iraq and got stuck in there, our patriots claimed, look, the U.S. is really powerful. Without understanding anything, journalists lauded their military prowess. Russia also entered Afghanistan. Do you remember how it all ended? It is obvious that the U.S. cannot do anything in their situation. As a result, the entire Islamic world hates them. When the global mafia collapses the dollar printed by the US, all people will say, it serves you right, bastards. But do you think this will make ordinary people's lives better? That's a big question. That's the prism through which we should look at things. We should also take into consideration that only 5% of the world's population lives in the US. These 5% consume almost 50% of the energy resources extracted by humanity. Now imagine that we are that very mafia. We realize that the US is the guiding light for the world. In other words, the American lifestyle is propagandized. You know our countrymen who live in the US live on welfare there. However, they live better there than they would live in Russia working. Imagine, we are those slave masters. We know that the US is the guiding light for everyone, and slaves don't work there. 
Besides, they live better on welfare than if they worked there. Do we need such masses of slaves who do not work? This is another reason why the collapse of the USA is inevitable. Kazma Prutkov, a collective pen name, has many aphorisms. One of these aphorisms is Many things we do not understand, not because our understanding is weak, but because these things are not integrated in the conceptual circle of our understanding, which corresponds to a children's Russian song. Dili Dili Trolley Valley. This I never learned to do, they didn't teach us in our school. As for me, I have more than one diploma, I was trained to be a military man. This is what they taught us. Internal politics, domestic politics, is politics within your own country. It makes sense. External politics, foreign politics, is politics involving neighboring countries and nations. That was all I was taught. Now, I will tell you a new phrase consisting of two words – global politics. This is politics pursued towards the entirety of humanity on planet Earth. It does exist. The one who doesn't know or doesn't understand ways and methods of the pursuit of global politics, or in addition doesn't accept that global politics exists, becomes hostage to the one who knows and understands global politics and wields its methods. Even if you are the head of a mighty state, you can become hostage to the global mafia, unless you understand global politics along with its ways and methods of pursuit. As you see, the leaders of the USSR and the US pursued internal and external policies, but the global mafia pursued global policies. Therefore, the USSR was pulled down. The same destiny awaits the US. There is something else you also need to integrate in the conceptual circle of your understanding. We were taught to plan things at least within the boundaries of five years. The majority of people cannot plan for the long term or beyond the boundaries of five years. Imagine, there are people on Earth who have 50-year plans and 100-year plans for humanity. Then you will look at many things in a different way. Now, let's illustrate such 50 and 100-year plans. Our fathers and grandfathers during the time of great construction projects were building the Sayana Shushanskaya Dam, the Bratsk Hydroelectric Power Station, LEP 500, and other things. Today, thanks to the brainless reformers, Western representatives of the global mafia have become masters of all this. In particular, speaking of Yukas, the trial over Khodorkovsky has begun. Today was the first hearing. Who stood behind him? Lord Rothschild was. You should integrate global politics into the conceptual circle of your understanding. One should also understand that some have 50 and 100 year plans. What we think happens today actually fits into more long-term politics. Going forward, I want to say, imagine, you are Rothschild or Morgan. You want to conquer Russia. Do you need rich competitors such as Lushkov, Khodorkovsky, Yeltsin, and so on? I think it is obvious. You don't need them. They are all just boys who do not understand which games they play and with whom. They are all doomed if they don't reach the understanding of global politics. They think they are brilliant guys. However, look how many of them have fallen on the battlefields. Will this make our life easier? That's the question. So, what's going on? Where does the cause lie? On Earth, there is a global system crisis in all spheres of life. In attempts to solve these global problems, the Mafia has made the decision to proceed at the expense of our country. They do this by means of cultural cooperation. Having attempted to conquer our resources during the Great Patriotic War, they got a dignified response from our fathers and grandfathers, who upheld the independence of our motherland. Therefore, the Mafia decided to use information wars as a weapon. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever heard that the USSR suffered defeat in the Cold War? I think you have.
Another question. How do you treat the fact that our motherland suffered defeat in this war? I can tell you. The majority of Russians remain indifferent to it. They say, come on, what war? We have democracy everywhere. Everything is fine. It doesn't bother me. If it doesn't bother you now, it will bother you soon. You just think about these two words, hold war. A war at all times has precise goals. A war is a complex of measures aimed at seasoning an opponent's natural, energy and human resources. Being parasites on others' labor, they want to live comfortably, in parasitic luxury. This is the goal of any war. This goal can be reached in two ways. The first one is a hot or conventional war, where you conquer a country by means of military force. But this is not an effective way. Why? Because people can become partisans by joining guerrillas. They will resist. What is a cold war? It's an information war. It is when people, the victims of this subtle aggression, get so duped that they cannot even understand that they live in the occupied country. As a result, the goals of this war are achieved. Look at how Russian gas, oil, timber, gold, aluminum, and so on flow into the West. We do it with our own hands. The brilliance of this strategy of warfare is that the victims actually occupy themselves. They do it with their own hands. Although we do not see the blue helmets in the streets of our cities, we actually live in an occupied country. The goals of the war have been reached. One group of our own countrymen plunders the country. The second group protects the ones who plunder. The third group substantiates the plundering with the help of scientific theories, primarily along with the assistance of economical and historical theories. The fourth group dupes some people by means of spiritual movements, so that they won't understand what's going on. Do you think it's just a pure coincidence that in our country there are so many sects? What for? In order to keep people from thinking that they are being annihilated. They are so-called spiritual dead ends. Some of our countrymen indirectly get others drunk. Alcohol doesn't stop flowing. Women in villages have begun to drink. Students drink beer at break. You can see 12-year-old boys and girls with cans of beer all over the country. There are also a lot of drugs. On average, a hard drug addict lives for 30 years. Give or take 2-3 years. What's more, he pays money for being killed. Speaking of drugs, there are three profitable markets in the world. The most powerful market which brings huge incomes is a raw material market. The second one is an arms market. The third one is a drug market, which now occupies the second place, pushing out the arms market. An important thing to note is that the representatives of the drug market are the English royal dynasty, which has been controlling the world's drug market since the opium wars in China. Princess Diana was killed for trying to move from one mafia clan into another. One doesn't get forgiven for that in such circles. Speaking of political figures in the US, Bush is a member of the royal dynasty, but Clinton is a member of the Democrats. When someone is brought into power, this is taken into consideration. When we hear in the news about Colombian cartel that was pushed down, all this tells us is that these cartels refuse to share their spoils. If some mafia do not want to share, troops are immediately sent to establish order. Do you remember the Falklands War? This is a good example. Let's look at what they do towards us. So they start a cold war, not a hot war. However, the goals have been reached. Many have heard of Dali's doctrine, the central document of a conspiracy to destroy the Soviet Union through the corruption of its values and heritage. We refer to the Doctrine 20-1, August 18, 1948. What does it say? Russians cannot be conquered by force. In order to seize their resources and the riches of the country, we have to sow discord between different peoples within the country. As you know, Russia is a multinational country. 
We also have to sow discord between religious confessions. We also have to detach young generations from older generations, inject the cult of sex, debauchery, drug and alcohol addictions. They also support writers and other artists beneficial for and loyal to the authorities, while pushing down unwelcome and disloyal ones. All this filth is propagated on TV as a culture. In fact, this is pure Satanism in the open form. Having implemented this culture, they reached their goals. This doctrine was being developed and changed. Before the perestroika, it went by the name Harvard Project on the Soviet Social System. After the university in the US where social technologies on the destruction of our motherland were being developed. Harvard Project involves the dismemberment of Russia into around 30-40 small independent states and the reduction of the population down to 15-50 million slaves working in raw material extraction industries. According to the official census, the population of Russia is 144.5 million people. That means at least 100 million people have to vanish. Not to go beyond the lip service, I want to quote The Guardian. I want to quote the former Prime Minister of Great Britain, John Major. We defeated Russia in the Cold War. Russia has to be a resource exploitation country of the West. Therefore, the population of Russia has to be no more than 50 million people. Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady, who many people admire, stated with sheer cynicism in the same newspaper, 15 million Russians is enough. As they say, here is the physical evidence. As far as these leaders were concerned, 100 million people should vanish. I travel around the country, I meet different people, answer their questions and hold lectures. Elderly people ask me questions that bother them, like questions on medicine. I always say that this is all inscribed into the global scenario. We are of no use to the global mafia. We are excess population. It is like you are on the chopping block with an axe of an executioner over your head, and you say, give me something to eat. So only we can help ourselves. We are being annihilated. There is a full-scale war ongoing against our country in order to annihilate us. The reason is not that they don't like us or they just have nothing else to do. The real reason is the global system crisis on planet Earth. The global mafia makes attempts to solve the problems created by them at the expense of our country to the detriment of Russia, at the expense of Russia, and on the ruins of Russia. This is an answer to the question what's going on. It's thrilling to believe that the main toolkit of our country's destruction appeared to be our high-ranking leadership in the face of the Central Committee of the Communist Party. They took advantage of a simple fact. Imagine, you are a member of the Central Committee or the Politburo you have everything you want. In the morning, you board your plane and fly to Sochi for a rest. In the evening, you come back to Moscow. After that, you attend a Politburo meeting. You have a wonderful life. When the time comes for your retirement, you realize that you want to pass it all to your children or grandchildren. This was achieved through privatization. It is well known that the Harvard project was implemented at the highest level of Soviet power. As a result, they bought it. They were given kind of a carte blanche to do some things. Figuratively speaking, Gorbachev was told, you will go down in history, you will turn Russia in another direction. Anything was allowed to be done in terms of plundering the country, taking as much as one could. There was even a kind of an official slogan – take it while Gorbachev is in power. So everybody did. People were not openly told, but they were given to understand that they could take as much as they could. Besides, the plundering of the country was also deliberately organized by those who were aware of such plans. 
Everyone took what they could take. Those who were able to dismember from the USSR and establish a republic did so. Those who worked in industries privatized them and opened joint stock companies. Those who had nothing got a voucher like a dog got a bone and were told to wait, and soon they would be rich. Everyone took what they could take. As a result, they swallowed the bait of the Harvard project. Now, pay attention to the difference between the following sentences. Butter became more expensive. The dollar exchange rate went up or down. The USSR collapsed. Now let's say it in a different way. Shopkeepers increased the price for butter. The global mafia increased the dollar exchange rate. The USSR was dismembered in order to seize its resources. Now you may understand these sentences in a different way. What have I done? I have called a spade a spade. The important thing is, there are no uncontrolled processes. If there is something ongoing, it is of use to someone. In human society, there are no coincidences. Many things are subordinate to global politics, whether we like it or not. They keep telling us that the USSR collapsed on its own. Scientists and political scientists believe that empires can come down by themselves. Empires do not come down by themselves. The USSR was dismembered. The highest Soviet leadership was used as a toolkit to reach this goal. The present leadership is also doomed. Looking at all these republics, you see that life didn't improve there. We should understand that there are 50 and 100 year plans. When it was the right time, the USSR was pulled down. When the right time comes, other countries will also be pulled down. The Soviet Mafia, the Communist Party, knew precisely what they were doing. They therefore decided to do this dirty work with the hands of young reformers. As a result, outstanding reformers such as Chubais, Burbulis and others showed up. What did the Soviet power count on? They counted on these reformers doing their dirty work after which these reformers should have been removed somehow. But these reformers acquired a taste for money and gave the powers that be in the Central Committee the finger. The current ongoing process is a redistribution of property, which pushes them to kill each other. They keep killing each other, which is part of the Harvard project. Look, they kill each other all over the country. It touches upon everyone, from owners of small shops to governors, including these privatizers in Moscow and St. Petersburg, as well as those at the highest levels of power. The redistribution of property also caused attempts to assassinate the leaders of the former Soviet states. This is exactly what the Harvard project includes. Sooner or later, this people's time, whom I mentioned, will come. But I doubt that this will do us any good. The first phase of this project was carried out. As a result of this plundering, clans began to emerge. I will touch upon this in more detail later. Speaking of Putin, we should understand the following thing. The government, the state Duma and the president are not the main guys in our country. They are just talking heads behind whom there stand numerous clans. These clans are the main guys in the country. These clans emerged on a federal level, as well as on a regional level, using resources gained from the plundering of the country. The most powerful clan family is headed by Yeltsin. As I told you, everyone took what they could take. The plundering of the country on the federal level was headed by his family. The plundering on a regional level was headed by governors. Do you think that there is even one governor who is clean? They all plunder the country. Thus, they swallowed the bait of the Harvard project. They have only two ways out. 
run away if they can, or go to prison. Hardly anybody knows that Lushkov, the mayor of Moscow, is one of the richest people in the world. Moscow is a center through which a lot of finance travels. Lushkov decided to intercept these financial currents. However, with the help of the TV news presenter and information killer Sergei Leonidovich Dorenko, he was given to understand that he was on the wrong path. Lushkov, therefore, had to shout out on TV, Yeltsin! Yeltsin! thereby publicly proclaiming his loyalty to the family. In total, there are three clans who created and own their own parties in the government. Yeltsin's family has a political party named Unity, where Shoigu is the chairman. Lushkov's clan is represented by political party Fatherland. Political party All Russia, headed by Shamiev, represents the regional clans. These very clans are the main guys in the country. As for the president and others, they are just talking heads. They still can't make any influential decisions. 80% of all the finance circulates in the so-called black market business and belongs to these clans. A meager 15-20% of that finance goes into the budget. Therefore, there are insufficient means to pay teachers, military men, and so on. However, everybody addresses the president, as he is the visible power. In fact, the real power remains invisible. It is not so easy to dance with these clans. Lushkov now joins all the regional clans. Putin is trying to confront it. Speaking of the United Russia party, their name does not indicate an actual intention to unite the country. I think you remember that commercial on TV, Head and Shoulders, two in one. This is the same, but three in one. Three parties, Unity, Fatherland and All Russia were combined into one. If you have listened to me attentively, you can guess who combined them. However, the parties began to understand that they were being used as a mechanism for voting in the Duma. Beforehand, being an official was advantageous, as an official could make money by lobbying interests. Now they are all the united voting mechanism. They have therefore split, as they have to stand for the interests of their clans. However, this does not benefit us. The second phase of Russia's dismemberment relied on the governors. Yeltsin stated, take as much sovereignty as you want. This is included in the Harvard project as part of their plan. Having plundered their own country, the governors were faced with that dilemma of what to do. The problem is that such a country is of no use to all these presidents of the republics, cries and regions. Because in this country they can be held responsible for what they have done. They willingly fulfill separatist ambitions. Chechnya was just one of the triggers to pull down Russia. An important fact to understand is that there are structuralist ways of governance. Here is an example of Primorsky Krai when Nazratenko was a governor there. At the time, Primorsky Krai was faced with many problems. One of them was central heating. There was also an hourly supply of electricity. People didn't get their wages. They even had to make fire out in the street to cook food. This state of living produced a mood in the people where they began to think about separating from Russia and joining Japan in the hopes that they would have something to eat at least. The Yakuts were told, guys, the place where you live is rich in diamonds, separate from Russia, stop sending money to the budget in Moscow, and you will live like the folks in southern Rhodesia. General Labed who died in 2002, was a bad man. We don't observe this Roman tradition of the dead nothing but good is to be said. We speak of the person objectively, 
as they deserve. General Labed probably did not understand it, but in fact he was going to be used in order to create the Siberian Republic. He stated, we regard Moscow as a neighbor beyond the Urals. This, in other words, is separatism. Eduard Russell, a governor of Sverdlovsk Oblast, stated, we will create the Uralsk Republic. Shaimiev would have created the so-called Muslim Ark, Great Tatarstan, which was supposed to divide Russia. North Caucasus would have gone under the protectorate of the Muslim world. Nikolai Kondratenko in Kuban said, We are Cossacks, we are on our own. Lushkov would have created the Great Duchy of Moscow. The Republic of Karelia would have joined Finland, Sweden and Norway. In the 1989 edition of the magazine Ogonok, there is a map of Russia's intended dismemberment. Having created the federal districts, Putin temporarily prevented this from happening. Thus, he scared the regional elites. Now we see a consolidation of the regions, a uniting of the oblasts. This mind of Russia's future dismemberment was planted by Lenin. Stalin was against this division on ethnic and territorial grounds. However, Lenin's position won. Now we deal with what was planted by Lenin. It was Lenin who sowed the seeds of separatist ambitions. This is now being fulfilled by means of the Cold War, aimed at dismembering Russia. Let's sum up. What's going on in our country is not a coincidence. The cause of all this is a global system crisis. The global mafia, ruling all the social processes, tries to solve the accumulated problems at the expense of Russia. Russia is that dainty pie at the expense of which they try to solve territorial, energy, raw material and other problems. Russia is a battlefield on which an ongoing information war rages. Who is to blame for that? The answer is simple – the globalists. They showed up first in the time of ancient Egypt. All human history is a process of concentrating governance of the productive forces of humanity. Understanding this, a question should arise – what to do? Now, let's look at it like this. Who wins in a hot, conventional war? The one who has more powerful and contemporary weapons – tanks, cannons, planes and so on. And the one who wields these weapons best. Who wins in a cold information war? The one who best possesses and wields the more powerful information. We should understand by means of which ways and methods this cold war is pursued. I represent those people who began to see the truth of it all when Brezhnev was in power. It was obvious that our country was going the wrong way. The core of our group were naval officers, then officers of other types and branches of the military, civilian specialists of different areas and disciplines joined us. They were economists, philosophers, engineers, teachers, historians and so on. As a result of trying to find a way out, the conception of social safety was created. This is what we are discussing in all our videos. In this introductory lecture, I want to give you some basics for a better understanding. In the conception of social safety, we look into the topics of worldview and philosophy. You may wonder, what these questions have to do with what we have spoken about thus far? Actually, there is a direct connection. The principle of the global mafia is well known, it is divide and conquer. Or you may say, divide, pit against each other and conquer. This principle is realized by means of raising the main question. What is primary, matter or consciousness? Let's go into this. If man perceives the surrounding world correctly, then he makes the correct decisions. 
But if man perceives the outside world incorrectly, distortedly, or he doesn't even understand anything, then he makes erroneous decisions. Which science teaches us to perceive the surrounding world? It is philosophy. He tells us about the world structure and other philosophical categories. Philosophy contains two powerful opposing teachings. These are materialism and idealism. In materialism, matter is primary, but spirit is secondary. In idealism, it is vice versa. Therefore, there is a conflict between them. Materialists are against idealists. By what means is this conflict brought about? The thing is, all processes in the universe are interdependent and interconditioned. They are also oscillatory. Everything is an oscillation. Sound is oscillatory. Light is oscillatory. The electron is oscillatory and moves around the atom. The nucleus is in the molecule. The Earth spins around the Sun. The Moon spins around the Earth. All these oscillations represent the process of the Trinity. Matter changes the information content according to the measure of development. In other words, any thing is material, has order and an image. It also contains the entire measure of itself, all the information of itself. What did the ancient Egyptian Ratsis do? They passed matter to science. Information of sacred spirit went to the church and they concealed measure. Thanks to this concealment, they were able to establish the global principle of governance. As a result, materialists and idealists incorrectly perceive the surrounding world. We will cover this in more detail later. The next topic we will cover is cause-effect relationships. Let's draw such parallels. As I am a military man, I would like to give you an example from my military service. Imagine, you are a regiment commander, you are fighting a battle. If you estimate the situation correctly, where the enemy is, what kind of arms he has and what you have, then the more correctly you estimate, the more correct decision you will make. This is an example. I am just drawing parallels between the societal situation estimation and the situation on the battlefield. These are all cause-effect relationships. The second range of questions considered in the conception of social safety concerns human history. But this history is viewed not as ordinary history, the way historians usually do, where events are viewed as separate and cause-effect relationships are not taken into proper consideration. Instead, history is viewed as a small fragment in the global evolutionary development of planet Earth's biosphere. We will also touch upon it in the following lectures. However, for now, I would like to pose the following question. Is human history a range of coincidences or a chain of patterns? All scientists admit that it is a pattern. Further on, a question arises. Who determined these patterns? How does history continue? Is it ruled or not? If it is ruled, which methods are of its ruling? What's the reason for what happens? What are the cause-effect relationships? In the conception, we explored a wide range of topics, such as the origin of man, the influence of the biosphere on mastering genetically determined potential, and many others. But the most important thing we came to understand is that history is a ruled process. It turns out that we still live in the global slave civilization, which came into existence in the earliest times. From textbooks on history, we know that there were slave masters who had overwatchers and slaves. Someday slave masters realize that the best slave is a slave who doesn't even understand that he's a slave, but enjoys wearing his chains. 
Imagine a slave with a collar around his neck, chained to a galley, or a slave working on a plantation. A slave always thinks about escaping. Labor productivity is low, therefore overwatchers are needed, whom you have to pay, so that they can oversee your slaves. These slave masters came up with a question. What do we have to do so that our slaves are eager to work for us? We have to give slaves what they want. What do slaves want? They want freedom. But if we give them freedom, they won't be slaves anymore. Instead of freedom, let's give an illusion of freedom. Such an illusion was created and realized in the early times. It was realized through religions. When religious beliefs as a toolkit for mass manipulation reached a dead end, the process of fooling people was transformed into a secular ideology. The most recent powerful ideology fooling people was Marxism. They keep scaring us with different isms – socialism, capitalism, monarchism and so on. But in fact, we still live in the global slave civilization. To see the structure of this civilization, you should take a $1 banknote and have a look at its back. There you can see a pyramid. The top of that pyramid is disconnected from the remaining part, which shines in rays. Below the pyramid, there is an inscription saying Novus Order Seclorum which means New World Order. This pyramid which I show you symbolizes the real order, which exists in all countries and nations on planet Earth. On the top of this pyramid there are slave masters. Below them there are overwatchers. Below overwatchers there are slaves. Restraining people in this crowd elite structure is realized by means of injecting knowledge into different stratums of society. If next to this pyramid we draw an upside-down pyramid, it will look like this. Those on the top possess the entirety of knowledge, and overwatchers get factual knowledge within the limits of their concern. For instance, if you are a transport minister, you should know to only work within the boundaries of your duties. Figuratively speaking, you should know how to make train schedules, but not history. If you are a defense minister, you should know how to operate a tank, but not economy. Note, the slogan is, everyone has to work honestly, which actually means without knowing the whole truth. Those in the low part of the pyramid have absolutely nothing. Our conception is not abstract. I want to give an example. In our country, patriots in meetings shouted out, Power to the people! Let's look into this slogan. Chernomyrdin and Chubais are the elite overwatchers. If we put them in prison and make them do some hard work, like cutting trees with a two-man saw, will they cope with this work? Yes, they will. With a dog barking at them and a guard in a watchtower, they will cope with it. First, they will get blisters, but then it will be fine. But if an honest lumberjack is appointed as a minister of timber industry, will he cope with his work? No, he won't. He can cope with his work, but only after he gains necessary knowledge. Gaining this knowledge will take time. Within this time, those who know what to do can fool him around or make him incapable. When patriots shout out, power to the people, we ask them, do you know what to do? They answer us, we will figure out what to do after overthrowing the hateful regime. But in fact, after overthrowing the hateful regime, they don't know what to do. Why? Because knowledge is power. For this reason, everyone has to master necessary knowledge, including governance knowledge. 
This crowd elite model is realized through the system of preschool, school, higher and academic education. Nowadays, many scientists know only their narrow specializations. It is like a dispute between those who study natural sciences and those who study humanitarian sciences, where either can only discuss what's relevant to their field. Neither understands either subject holistically. In other words, everyone does their work honestly, so to say without understanding the whole truth. Speaking of global, external and internal politics, what do we have? How does this global structure look with regards to this pyramid? There is this global mafia. Then there are headless countries and nations on planet Earth. They are Japan, France, Russia, among other countries. Look, the global mafia sets tasks for each country through globalization, which is a concentration of the productive forces of humanity. How does this play out? Let's look at some examples. Japan's role is high-tech. The USA's role is to be the world policeman. Spain's role is a world resort. Russia's role is for resource exploitation. These are the results of concentrating the productive forces of humanity. Every cricket must know its heart. The global mafia pursues their global policies. But leaders of countries only pursue internal and external policies. Whatever they are, general secretaries or presidents, if they don't know or don't understand global politics, they are hostages to those who know and pursue it. Now, let's go back to the beginning of our introductory lecture. I said that there were two powerful agitation points. They were the USA and the USSR. We were frightened with imperialism, but they were frightened with communism. In fact, both of the regimes represented the global pyramids, which I showed you. However, the global mafia began to become concerned that the leadership of the US and the USSR would come to an understanding of global politics, and therefore the global mafia would be played for suckers. You know there is such a play, The Cherry Orchard, written by Anton Chekhov where there is a mistress of the cherry orchard, overwatchers, and the village with serf peasants living in it. In this play we meet a rich merchant, who has a plan to take over the orchard and con the mistress. The global mafia decided to prevent the possibility of being conned in the same way. How did they do this? Let me demonstrate. Once there was a bipolar world, but now there is a multipolar world. What is a bipolar world? It is two agitation points. They are the same. However, there was an open crowd elite system in the US, but in the USSR there was a hidden crowd elite system. Do you think the Politburo had the same lifestyle as ordinary people? No, they didn't for sure. As you see, the US had an elite, and the USSR had an elite. But in the US the elite was legalized, and in the USSR it was hidden. In order to solve their own issues, the global mafia decided to legalize the elite in Russia. What issues? Imagine you are a Rothschild. You don't have your own troops or your Ministry of Finance. You rule countries and nations in a structuralist way. This is what we are going to talk about later. It is when puppies do what we want them to do. But if these puppies understand that they are being fooled, they can con us, then we have to prevent them from understanding that they are being fooled. As a result, they decided to bring these two agitation points to a collapse and thus turn this bipolar world into a multipolar world. Beforehand, this principle, divide and conquer, was like this. They turned the USSR and the USA against each other, which enabled them to live perfectly. 
Imagine, we rule transnational corporations. We produce helicopters, submarines and so on. It all belongs to us. We create tension in countries. Thus, we offload weapons. First, we create a submarine. Then we organize a small war, which enables us to reveal deficiencies of weaponry. As a result, this weaponry needs modernizing. In the end, it leads to the appearance of the two powerful corporations, which intend to take over our power, the power of the global mafia. We, the global mafia, have to prevent this from happening. We therefore decide to pull down these two corporations. How? Imagine, one corporation produces Jiguli, and the other one produces Ford. You are the owner of both these corporations. In these corporations there are directors. What do I have to do in order to avoid being conned by these directors? I split each corporation into a few workshops. One workshop makes carburetors, another one makes wheels, and so on. No workshop can independently produce cars. According to the agenda of the global mafia, the first one was the USSR. The USSR was dismembered. They also have the same plan towards Russia. But the same destiny awaits the USA too. Nowadays, they make the US look like an evil empire. By the way, a map of the intended, dismembered states of America was also published. What I saw on the map was like this. Alaska is the Christian states of America. Florida is the Muslim states of America. On the map there is also the independent Republic of Texas and the French states. When they were settling down in the territory of contemporary Canada, the dominance in this process were the French. Therefore, now they struggle to make French a state language. The mechanism which is now used against the USA was also used to pull down the USSR. The reason for what is happening is that the global mafia, heads of transnational banks and corporations, want to remain the masters of the planet. They make all this look like a shift from the bipolar world to the multipolar world. By the way, do you remember how we began our lecture? We began it from the discussion of anti-globalists. Many people think that anti-globalists are a good thing. But in reality, anti-globalists are a toolkit of the global mafia, globalists. Can you imagine that out of nowhere and without incentive, thousands of anti-globalists get together in Vienna or Canada to make pogroms? Butter became more expensive somehow by itself. You remember that? The truth is, someone has to organize them and pay them money. Why are anti-globalists of use to the global mafia? The global mafia is moving the governance process from the basis of the bipolar world onto the multipolar world. Every country does its work honestly, as I told you, without understanding the whole truth. As you see, anti-globalists represent the agenda of the global mafia. With understanding what I said, everything gets clear. Further on, we came to understanding the role of the jury. It turned out that Jews fell as the first victim of the global mafia. Imagine, we are the global mafia. We govern countries and nations. If country X carries out the tasks entrusted to it in a bad way, slaves work in mines poorly, the elite becomes decadent, such as during the era of stagnation in our country, if this happens, then our plans are not fulfilled. We are that mafia. Who is to blame in our opinion? A simple worker or the one who governs the country? The answer is obvious, the one who governs. What do we have to do in order to ensure that country X carries out the tasks entrusted to it? We have to replace the incapable government officials with capable ones. How do we do this? We increase tensions among ordinary people. 
These people hate these officials. As a result, the people eliminate the elite, who don't understand what's going on. In the Russian language, there is a slogan which goes Beat the Yids and save Russia. Having come into existence in ancient Egypt, the Mafia, the ancient Egyptian Jratsis, needed a specific troop in order to realize their plans. Egypt waged wars for living space and often lost these wars. As a result, the task was to wage wars and not lose them. They achieved this through cultural cooperation, cultural exchange. To realize it, they needed a troop armed not with bows and arrows, but with informational weapons. The jury was turned into such a troop. By the way, why do we have this law against anti-Semitism, but not anti-jury? The Semites were originally nomadic Arab tribes. The Jratsis picked out one of the Semitic tribes and took them into the desert for 42 years. A question arises, why did they take these poor people to the desert for 42 years, which one can cross within 2-3 weeks? The size of the Sinai Peninsula is close to the size of the Crimean Peninsula. The thing is that the old died quickly in the desert, as there was no water but only heat. Those who were born in the desert didn't hear stories about the past from their grandparents. In other words, Ivans, who don't remember their ancestry, began to show up. This tribe didn't work. They at Samolina, free of charge, brought to the desert by the ancient Egyptian Jratsis. Moses was the only Jrats who knew where the next portion of Samolina was coming from. The tribe was illiterate, therefore they couldn't escape from the desert. Read the Bible, it's all there. Those people were turned into hostages. What did they do? In daylight they accelerated the march. But in the evening they had brainwashing sessions, conducted by the Jrats to a guide called Moses. What did he tell them? I quote, Now, therefore, hearken, or Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them, that ye may live, and go in and possess the land which the Lord, God of your fathers, giveth you. What are they told to do? Listen. Thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother, only Jews, usury of money, usury of vittles, usury of anything that is lent upon usury. Here it means money at interest. Unto a stranger, not Jews, thou mayest lend upon usury, but unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all that thou settest thine hand to, in the land whither thou goest to possess it. And thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. And the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls, and their kings shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor have I had mercy on thee. Therefore thy gates shall be open continually, they shall not be shut day nor night, that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish, yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. This is a quotation, you can check it. All these abominable teachings are regarded as sacred. I sent Patriarch of Moscow and all Rus, Alexei II, a letter with my signature on it, asking him, was this all written by God? Since 1993 there hasn't been a response, and there never will be. I think you know why. What can he say in reply? 
The Pope stated that the way the Bible is set out needs revising, as it doesn't correspond to contemporary terminology, and so on. He understands that something needs changing concerning the Bible. Let's go back to jury. Having created this instrument, the Zhratsis committed an anti-human action. You know, Jews have a ritual of circumcision for boys on the eighth day after the birth. They think this ritual came to them from God. This terrible mechanism led to the false formation and function of the human cerebral cortex algorithm. The human brain consists of the right and the left hemispheres. The right hemisphere is responsible for processing image thinking, but the left hemisphere is responsible for abstract logical thinking. Man has consciousness and subconsciousness. So to say, drawing cybernetic computing analogies, there is an operational memory, which processes quickly incoming information. There is also a long-term memory. It's like a storehouse. When man needs information from there, he takes it out of the long-term memory and switches it into the operational processing. That is why images, logics, consciousness and subconsciousness work according to a certain sequence of actions. The official term of what I said is algorithm. This algorithm is determined by human genetics by those things that are instilled on the genetic level and the social level. The most crucial is the initial period of a human's life, when this algorithm starts to form. Imagine a mason making the foundation level. If he lays all the bricks straight, then he will make the wall straight too. But if he doesn't make the foundation level, then he will fail to lay all the bricks straight. As for the material foundation, it can be remade by a mason, unlike the algorithm. When a boy is born, he begins to perceive the world correctly. He hears his mother's sweet voice, drinks his mother's milk, sees sunshine, and so on. He perceives the surrounding world correctly. As a result, his algorithm of processing information forms correctly. Different sources say that beforehand circumcision was carried out with a stone knife and dirty fingernails. Nowadays it is generally carried out under anesthesia. But beforehand it was a painful procedure. As a result of this, the baby's brain switched off, somehow disconnected from the correct perception of the surrounding world, and focused on the pain. There were no sanitary conditions. As a result, the wound began to fester and itch. The brain is exposed to noise, which is unnatural for a baby. This experience is enough to break the process of a baby's world perception, which is impossible to correct in the future. Why? Because the temporal boundaries within which the child can master the first information is restricted by genetics. Let's look at the example of Mowgli the main character in Radyar's Kipling's novel, The Jungle Book. What's the essence of this story? If you have read the novel, then you know when a baby finds himself among animals, those animals bring him up, and then later he returns to live in human society, at the age of 10-14. It turns out that it is impossible to teach him to talk. Although he has a head, arms, legs, and a tongue, it is impossible to teach him to talk. Why? Because the temporal boundaries within which man can master anything is strictly restricted by genetics. There is a saying in Russian which goes, if little Ivan didn't learn, big Ivan will never learn. This is why the conception pays a lot of attention to it. We say that at a very early age, one should teach kids to correctly perceive the world. It seems like the ancient Egyptian dresses knew this. That was why they made it so that Jews circumcise a boy on the eighth day. Not like in the Muslim culture, when a boy is much older. 
Bear in mind that circumcision also has a negative influence on the opening of chakras. Why is it done? It is very easy to rule such people's subconsciousness through the bypassing of their consciousness. If we draw cybernetic analogies, they are bio-robots on a viable elemental base. Having created such a troop during the Sinai hike, and having instilled the reproduction system which was supported throughout generations. Jury spread all over the world and split into 13 tribes. What happened to them throughout history? In Spain, they got killed. In England, there was an attempt to introduce Judaism during the English Civil War. Jews also suffered during the French Revolution. When Columbus went to search for gold, Jews were behind all this. Note that Jews are always being blamed for something. What did the global mafia do? They hid in the tribe of Levi and became Levites, the first priests. It was them who had a monopoly on knowledge and the interpretation of the truth. Rabbis are the shepherds of the Jewish herd spread all over the world who have to strictly follow the Levites' orders. This is what one calls the world behind the curtain, or the forces of the West, in our country, in Russia. It is made to seem that Jews are behind it all. However, the Mafia always remains behind the curtain. Nobody sees them, and nobody knows them. This is why Jews are always persecuted. Speaking of Hitler, after all the rich Jews left, he ordered the death of poor Jews, such as teachers, doctors, and so on. Thus the society let off steam, but the real masters stayed in the shade, making it all look like Jews were to blame for everything. I talked to Russian patriots, so-called patriots, from different political parties. I told them that they work for the interests of the world behind the curtain, because they don't tell people the truth. As you see, all these Patriots are puppies. What do people in Russia think of all this? The Kremlin consists of Jews. Most bankers are Jews. Khodorkovsky is a Jew. Berezovsky is a Jew. Abramovich is a Jew. It makes people believe that Jews are to blame for all bad things in Russia. It brings them to the idea of beat Jews and save Russia. But this is exactly what the world behind the curtain wants. This is why the attitude towards Jews is being intentionally deteriorated. And this is done by so-called Russian patriots. Then we came to an understanding of the role of the religions. In the conception there is an analysis comparing all the holy scriptures, Torah, the Talmud, the Bible of the Old and New Testaments, the Quran, Buddhism, contemporary and ancient occult esoteric teachings, including Ronald Harbert's teaching. In the following lectures we will touch upon all these teachings. However, I would like to tell you something concerning Ronald Harbert's teaching and connect it with jury. The thing is that the global mafia realized that Judaism got exposed. So as their mechanism has been exposed, they have to change the elemental base. They've attempted to adapt Ronald Harbert's teaching, the so-called Dianetics, to solve their tasks. There is another crooked mirror, another distortion. They say work is divided into mental and physical. It is a lie. Doesn't a carpenter think when he works? Basically, work is divided into productive and governing. The productive work includes not only work of a plumber, a lathe operator, and so on, but also work of a doctor. His product is a cured human body. It is also work of a writer. He has an information product, a book. It also includes work of an inventor. He has an information or technical product. A painter's product is a picture. We can also measure the productive work. A lathe operator produces parts which one can measure, and thus this lathe operator can get his money.
How can one matter work of a ruler? By the way, many people think that there isn't such a thing as work of a ruler. If we look back at the pyramid, we see that some are rulers, but others are producers. The global mafia wants to change the management apparatus from Judaism to the Church of Scientology and its adherents. What's the reason for that? As I already said, Judaism got exposed. Ronald Harbour's Dianetics turned out to be suitable. Ronald Harbour is a physicist. He studied in the USA. When he was young, he got into some trouble somewhere in Southeast Asia, where he could have died. Luckily for him, he was saved by one of the locals who possessed shamanism. When he recovered, he was very much surprised that that guy had saved him. He studied to study this phenomenon and came to understanding how the cerebral cortex works. He drew cybernetic analogies and created a teaching of how to become happy. As far as we see, his teaching was adapted by the global mafia. What's the essence about? Imagine, a person is tormented by different doubts. For instance, it happens to him after an accident or behaving dishonestly. To make this person happy, one should help him get rid of these doubts or sufferings. For this, the person has to go through a clearing procedure. They also name it going through an episode. When a person comes there, he is asked about his fears. For instance, the person has had a car accident. He is told to recall how it happened. The point is, the person has to recall it a few times. Thus, he moves it onto the level of his consciousness. As a result, he is not scared anymore. This is the way he is cleared. After that, the person goes through an auditing procedure. This is how he is programmed to do certain activities, especially concerning governance activity. It happens like this. Two people, after the clearing procedure, tell each other bad things. One has to say like, you are a bastard, you are an idiot. But the other one has to smile and put up with it. These are the real skills what a ruler of that kind should wield. There are some other methods as well. Particularly, Kiryenka, first deputy chef of staff of the presidential administration of Russia, studied in a school of Ronald Harbert. These people memorize things well. They make decisions quickly. They are really good rulers but they are also hostages. Why? The system must, matter, energy, space and time is laid into their psyche. The false worldview is laid into their psyche. By the way, we will talk about it in the other videos. In fact, they are also bio-robots. The global mafia decided to change jury for adherence of the Church Scientology. What I said now has an impact on Israel. The global mafia is splitting. Some of them think that they should keep jury as a toolkit in order to fulfill governance processes. But some of them think that jury should be annihilated and changed for the Church of Scientology adherence. These two tendencies have an impact on Israel. Why are terrorist attacks carried out in Israel by the hands of these thoughtless Yasser Arafat. What is it done for? The thing is, jury was spread all over the world. Israel for Jews is a point of concentration where they create their own state and become a nation. Jews go back to Israel. Is it good or bad? We say that it is good. However, the global mafia doesn't want them to go back to Israel. This is why they organize terrorist attacks so that Jews won't want to go back to the place where they can die. When you know all these mechanisms, it all becomes clear. Stalin, assisted, contributed to the state creation of Israel. This is why Jews have to put up a memorial to Stalin, but instead they slander his name. Speaking of Jewry, what did Hitler do? 
he did the opposite thing. He solved a lot of tasks. Slaughtering Jews, he made them stick together. Why? When Stalin was in power, the USSR was the guiding light for all undeveloped countries. People in other countries realized that in the USSR, prices were going down, salaries and the living standard were going up. As a result, Jews were becoming disobedient towards the Mafia. They assimilated among others in Russia. It was unbeneficial for the Mafia. That was why Hitler conducted the task of frightening the Jews, thus making them stick together. It was like, guys, stick together or you will be killed. As you see, you should look at things through the prism of global politics. We have finished the topic, the global crisis, causes and effects. Within the first lecture, the introductory lecture, which consists of six videos, we have viewed the process of globalization, the inevitability of the USA's collapse, the methods of global governance pursuit, the way the USSR was brought down, the plans of the global governance towards Russia, the global manipulation of the masses, the specific instruments of the global governance, and so on. Next time we start the second lecture named The Global Governors, who really governs the world and how.